The message I've titled, Look at What We Have. Look at what we have. The Bible tells us right here in uh, chapter number four, in verse one, therefore seeing we have this ministry. And if you'll notice in verse number seven, the Bible said we have this treasure in earthen vessels. In verse number 13, we having the same spirit of faith. And then the Bible says in verse one of chapter five, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands. Now we have a ministry, the Bible says in chapter number four and verse number one, and you and I both know it's a glorious ministry. How do I know that? Because we've read 2 Corinthians chapter three. It's a very glorious ministry. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter three, verse six, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit, not of the Old Testament, not of the law, the Mosaic covenant, but of the, uh, of the spirit for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Now I've preached on this before in 2 Corinthians chapter number three, but when the Bible said for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life, you and I both know according to Romans chapter number three and verse number 20, no one has ever gotten saved by the law. No one, no one. It, it's no one. But the law did one thing according to Galatians. It set a standard that you and I had to recognize as God's standard. We had to recognize that standard as perfection. But no one can keep the law. I don't care how hard you try. I don't care. And there are people that's actually told me they've kept the law. Well, right there, they broke the law because they bore false witness. Amen. That's true. They lied. No one has ever kept the law except the Lord Jesus Christ. When he became man and walked the face of this earth and lived a sinless life, we beheld him without sin, a lamb without spot and without blemish. Therefore, he was qualified to go to Calvary to pay the sin debt of every mankind. So the letter killeth. What is the penalty of the law? Death. The Bible does not say that the law says try. The law says do. <clears throat> if you do not do, then there's death. Well, there is a more glorious covenant and the Bible even mentions that in the book of Hebrews, there's a better covenant with a better high priest. And so the better covenant, this, this, uh, this ministry that we have uh, by the spirit, the Bible says, it's the new covenant. It's that Jesus Christ paid your sin debt. And if you'll trust him, God will impute to you the righteousness of his dear son so you can go to heaven. Isn't that wonderful? So, so we see that the letter killeth, but the spirit, <clears throat> excuse me, giveth life. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more that the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. So we have a wonderful ministry. You and I have a wonderful ministry and this ministry helps us to keep going. It keeps us from being quitters. We don't want to quit. Paul confessed in 2 Corinthians chapter number one and verse number eight that his trials in Asia had almost brought him to utter despair, to be utterly at a loss. This ministry that we have, this glorious ministry, according to verse number two, three, and four, not only keeps us from quitting, but it keeps us from being deceivers. It keeps us from uh, mishandling the word of God in deceptive ways. And what people, how people do that is they pull verses out of context and they'll take one verse such as, such as what comes to mind is Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. You've got a group of people over here that will pull that one, and that by the way, that is Bible. That is the word of God. But they will pull that one verse out and tell you that you need to be plunged in water in order to go to heaven. No way does the Bible teach that. For by grace are you saved. Uh, through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Baptism is a picture of what's happened already on the inside. When you trusted Christ, you were buried with him in baptism and we are raised to walk in newness of life. 
When Christ came out of the tomb, you and I came out with him. Amen. Now, the Bible talks about this wonderful ministry keeps us from being deceivers. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 in verse number three, Paul said, but I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Why? Because there's other preacher, preachers preaching another gospel. And Galatians says in chapter one that there is not another. Although there be some that think there is, there is not another gospel. And the Bible even says in 2 Corinthians chapter three and four that people are preaching another Jesus. How in the world can you name the name of Jesus that we sang about? At the name of Jesus, every knee is gonna bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. At the name of Jesus, we sing a whole, we sing four stanzas at the precious name of Jesus. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he wonderful? Yes, he is wonderful. How do you preach another Jesus? Well, anyone that gets up and preaches another Jesus is using the name Jesus and then adding works to it, to salvation. See, the Bible makes it very clear that redemption is complete. Redemption is complete in Christ. Redemption means that Christ purchased the world. How did Christ purchase the world? With his blood, he died on Calvary and shed his blood for the remission of sins. He redeemed or purchased the world. Now, redemption is not regeneration. Titus chapter three and verse five speaks about regeneration. Regeneration is when you believe the message, the spirit of God quickens you as given in Ephesians chapter two. So we're quickened. We who were dead in trespasses and sin. But everything necessary for you to believe has already been done. And by the way, you don't even have to muster up this belief. The Bible said faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You want enough faith to believe Christ? You want to be an overcomer? According to 1 John chapter five, your faith is the overcoming principle. Then read the Bible. That's where I get my faith. That's where you get your faith. The Bible is, 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 is very clear that it's a sharp two-edged sword and can, and, and can pierce the dividing asunder of soul and spirit according to Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. Now, so it helps us to keep from being a deceiver. This ministry, stay on track with the ministry. What's the ministry? The glorious ministry of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It helps us from uh, being quitters, from being quitters. You remember over in 2 Timothy chapter number four when Paul said, I've fought a good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. And he said, henceforth has laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge shall give me in that day and not to me only, but to, all, to them also, all them also who love is appearing. And it goes on down in that same chapter in verse number 10 to say this, and this is probably one of the saddest verses in the New Testament as far as I'm concerned. And that is Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world. <clears throat> I wonder, <clears throat> I've been preaching for, since 1981, so that's 40 years. I've been preaching for 40 years and I have seen people walk in and seem like they get a hold of some truth. What happens, I really believe this, they'll come in the building, they'll come in church and they'll get that immediate need met. They will. Did you know the word works? If you apply the word, it's going to work. If you apply the word on your finances, your finances will be in better shape. If you, fi if you apply the word in your marriage, your marriage will be in better shape. Lost or saved man, if you apply the word, it's going to work. The word works. And what happens, I believe, is people come in and they get that immediate need met and then they're gone. They're gone. God fixed it, so now they're gone and they fall back in the same lethargy or the same situation they were in before. They quit. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed in Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, and on and on, the Bible says. Well, we don't need to be a quitter. I'll tell you what will stop you from being a quitter and what will help you to keep carrying on is to keep your nose buried in this precious book right here. Keep your eyes reading this book. Be in church when you need to be in church. Uh, when the doors are open, I understand work situations and sickness keeps us from uh, being in the house of God. I understand that. Uh, but be there. When every opportunity you get, be here. Why? Because you encourage 
the brethren when you're here. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves uh, one with another. The Bible says that doing so, we provoke one another unto good works. We provoke each other just by being here. So that's what we need to do. Read our Bibles, this wonderful ministry that we have and this great ministry that God has put in every believer and people say, well, I don't know if I could really witness or not. If you're saved, I know you can. You can tell what happened to you. The Bible makes it clear in Romans chapter number one and verse number 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, what it? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then verse 17 says, for therein is revealed the righteousness of God. Within the gospel is revealed the righteousness that you need to go to heaven from faith to faith. That means we learn some this Sunday, we learn some tonight, we learn some more truths Wednesday night and on and on and on till finally we see the whole thing and we say, thank you Jesus for taking care of my sin. And at that moment, the Bible says at the end of the law for righteousness, according to Romans 4.10, is Jesus Christ. At that moment, God imputes or lays to your account the righteousness of his dear son. I'm going to heaven. Brother Archer said, you better like me now because I'm, you're going to spend eternity with me. Amen. <laughs> you're going to spend eternity with me in heaven. I'm going to be there. I'll be there. I hope you will too. So this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful ministry that we have. You know what, uh, and it keeps us again from being deceivers. What, what I've found to be true, and this is not anyone else's quote, but what I've found personally to be true is that darkened minds, lost minds, the God of the world, according to verse 3 of 2 Corinthians 4, is hid because the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. What I found to be true is that people, a lot of people, had rather believe a complicated lie than a simple truth. Than a simple truth. I don't know if you've ever been in a company of mixed faith or mixed religion and you say something about the Lord and usually the saved person starts that conversation and then you got everybody coming from every corner out to try to add their two cents in. They do. You'd be surprised. No, you wouldn't be surprised what is out there. They had rather believe a complicated lie. And, and I know, um, I don't want to offend anybody, but to me probably the most complicated religion is uh, the one that's growing the fastest these days and that's Mormon religion. Yeah, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the growing. It's a complicated religion, how that you can, you know, they deny the deity of Christ, so that marks them off right there. But if you, if you they, they believe that, uh, that's why they used to teach polygamy. The more wives you have, the more children you have, the more children you have, you can populate your own planet. Uh, they teach you can be as gods. They're teaching the very first lie that Satan presented back in Genesis chapter three. Um, they, they believe in, in, in celestial, telestial, and terrestrial. And uh, you, can, you can actually be baptized for the dead and get your loved ones out of the telestial and get them into the celestial. I, why do I know these things? I was almost, I was almost a missionary in Utah. <laughs> I almost was. I almost surrendered to go to Utah and start a church back in 1981. Is why I had to learn some of these things. I thought, man, alive, this thing's complicated. And all you have to do, there was some, there was some, uh, and I, I, this wasn't in the message, but it's true. I had some <clears throat> come up to my carport over here. I live right here in the parsonage, and I didn't know if they didn't know that was connected to the church or what. But we had some of that persuasion come up to my carport, and you know they're real big on lineage. They're real big on lineage. They, they want you to, they want to, they want to get their foot in the door by getting you interested in where you came from. I, I don't want to know where I come from. My, my family came from England, probably a bunch of convicts. Got, got on the boat and came into North Carolina. I don't, I don't know. I don't know, but they wanted to get my lineage. 
And I smiled at them and I said, you know, I've already got that. Well, how did you get that, they said. I said, I got it out of the Bible. I got it out of the Bible and this Bible says that I could be a son of Abraham if I would believe Christ. So I can trace my lineage all the way back to Father Abraham. It blew their mind. They didn't know which way to turn. And when you, when you put in something truth that upsets their system of, of, of their witnessing, it, it scatters them. It scatters them. Then they got to get back to, to point one. Then they got to go point one, point two, point three, point four. But a child of God, my dear friend, has a glorious ministry. Has a wonderful, glorious ministry. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in it, not only that, but this wonderful ministry keeps you from being a promoter or a self-promoter. According to verse five and six, the Bible says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number four, verse five and six, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So this ministry helps us uh, from being self-promoters. We're here to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. We were doing a funeral not uh, too long ago and someone asked me um, for some pointers. And this is what I said. I said, if you will magnify Christ, you can't go wrong. If you will uplift Christ Jesus, you can never go wrong. And when we have a glorious ministry and realize it was only, the only reason I have this ministry according to verse one of chapter four is because I've received mercy. As we have received mercy. I've received mercy. And when you know the truth, when God actually puts that truth in your soul and your mind and your soul and you make a profession in the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have to second guess what's right. You know that he gave it to you. You know that you were not worthy. You know that. You know there's nothing you could ever do to gain audience with a holy God and you know from whence it came, then all you can do, and it should be a <clears throat> natural thing, to lift him up. I'm losing my voice, Brother David. You're contagious yeah I'm losing but anyway just lift Christ up lift Christ up all right so we have a wonderful ministry now not only that according to verse number seven we have a great treasure and this great treasure verse number seven this this treasure in earthen vessel this treasure within the vessel gives us gives the vessel its value it's not you that's worth something it's the treasure in you that Worth, worth something. Did you know, <clears throat> according to Job chapter 1, God guards the vessel. He puts a hedge of protection around the vessel. But you know what I've found is that you and I should guard the treasure. And I'm going to show you something. Turn over here, hold your place in 2 Corinthians. Go to 1 Timothy if you would, please. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 11. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11, Now, God guards the vessel. You and I should guard the treasure. The Bible says in verse 11 of 1 Timothy chapter 1, According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And then if you'll notice in chapter 6 of the same book, Timothy, chapter 6 and verse 20, 20 O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Not only are we to keep it which is committed to our trust, we are to preach it like it should be preached, proclaim it like it should be proclaimed, don't add, don't dilute, don't do anything, but just there it is. It's Christ Jesus and Him crucified. And, and He rose again the third day according to the scripture. And by the way, He rose again to prove that He was Almighty God. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 17. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, verse number 17, but as God hath distributed to every man 
as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk, so ordain I in all churches. Um, the Bible makes it very clear that we are to uh, keep that which you committed to our trust and share it. You can go on in Timothy to find the same thing as good soldiers ministering what we know to others, to tell others, to tell others, to tell others. So this ministry is a wonderful, wonderful, we have a treasure. It's the gospel within us, the gospel. And we do it for the sake of others. And then also, according to verse number 13, we have the same spirit of faith. And that's simply a confident faith. It's an attitude or an outlook of faith. Paul identified with the psalmist in the 116th Psalm in verse 10 when he said in verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 4, we having the same spirit of faith according, according as it is written, I believe and therefore have I spoken, we also believe and therefore speak. Tell what you know. I heard, I believe the truth. Tell what you know. So Paul actually adopted that same psalm and that same verse to his own person. We tell what we know. We believed and we tell others. Amen. It's the same spirit of faith. There's a core value, a core belief that we can never deviate from. Never, ever deviate from it. Don't. I know we were talking about, I started preaching in 81. You started maybe a little earlier than I did. But we find out some of the things that we said back then, we wish we could unsay them. I, I wish I could go back and unsay a few things that I've said. But there was a, that core doctrine of belief that you can never, never leave. And that's that same spirit of faith that Jesus Christ is God. He's deity. God became a man. God the Son. We understand that He was virgin born. He had to be virgin born because if he was born of the seed of man, he would have had a sin nature. He had to be virgin born. He, he, he had to be. We believe also in the vicarious death. We believe that all sin was placed on Christ and he died for our sin. One time, forever, for all. One time, the blood was shed. He won't come back and do it again. It's happened one time. And we need to preach that so people will believe it and trust in the redemption of Christ. One time. He will not come back and be beaten again. Amen. We believe in the glorious resurrection. After three days and three nights, he rose again from the dead. And I could put some other core values and core doctrine in there, but these things we believe and we never sway. We never uh, compromise on these beliefs. Amen. And so we have a confident, confident faith. And we're confident also of victory. Look at verse 14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. So we have, we're confident of victory. We're confident that God will be glorified. <coughs> verse 15. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many down to the glory of God. We're confident that our trials are for us and not against us in verse 17 and 18. You see that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Amen. And read uh, verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal. And then, my dear friend, the last thing is we have a building of God. Just some things that we have. We have this ministry, the Bible said, it's a glorious ministry according to chapter 4 and verse number 1. And then we have this treasure according to chapter 4 and verse 7. We have the same spirit of faith, that confident faith, according to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13, but then according to chapter 5 and verse 1, we have a building of God. All of these things that we have are a testimony to the reality 
of the Christian faith. All these things that we have. Now, the building of God <coughs> is... <coughs> I'm going to bring it down a notch. I'm going to bring my voice down a notch, okay? Like we do the singing. This building of God is not our heavenly home mentioned in John chapter 14. The Bible says, "If uh, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I have a mansion in heaven. You know that. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said that he goes, Christ did, and went to prepare a place for us. And if he goes and prepares a place for us, the emphatic, I will come again, receive you unto myself. When, that's a wonderful building. But the building we're talking about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1 is a glorified body. Is a glorified body. And the Bible said it's not made with hands. And Paul, you remember, was a tent maker. And Paul uh, made things with his hands. He made dwelling places with his hands. But this building is eternal that God makes. And it never shows sign of weakness. It never shows sign of decay. Second Corinthians chapter number four and verse number seven, this present body is an earthen vessel or a temporary tent, a temporary body. And it's subject to weakness. But the Bible says in chapter five and verse number one, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And the Bible said, for in this we groan. We groan. And the Bible also says in verse four, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened. Now, you can go back to Romans chapter number eight and find that all of creation groans to be set free. And this is not a, I wish I were dead situation. This is I can't wait till I get my new body situation. That's what that is. The whole world groans all the way from the creature to creation. The world is reeling and rocking. The world is wanting to be set free. I'm talking about the physical world, this earth that God created. It's groaning to be set free. All the tornadoes, the hurricanes, the volcanoes, the tsunamis. It's groaning to be set free. But not only that, this creature is groaning to be set free. Waiting for the adoption to wit. And the Bible said that adoption to wit is a new body. You see, <clears throat> Faith Baptist Church in Milton, Florida, believes in a full gospel. I'm real hesitant to say that, especially with visitors in the church. Because usually when you see a full gospel church, that's all the hoopla and the backflips and all that kind of stuff. Could you imagine my age trying to do a backflip or walking on some pews? It'd kill me. When I say full gospel, when I say full gospel, I heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, what we've been preaching. And I believed Him. I believed that everything necessary for me to go to heaven was done on Calvary's cross when he said it's finished. And he rose again to prove it was all true, proving to be the Son of God, Romans chapter 1. I believe that. And then the Bible tells me as I keep reading and studying the Word of God, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, it says to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. I started right here, the moment I trusted Christ and the imputed righteousness of His dear Son, Him living in me, I'm baptized in the body of Christ. Him living in me, now I'm enjoying my journey. I'm working out something I possess, working out my salvation. And as it, it needs to be that I am being conformed more to the image of Christ. But then the Bible says over here in Romans chapter 13, verse 11, now is our salvation nearer than when I first believed. I was saved by grace through faith. Not, not of myself, it was a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
I'm enjoying this life walking and working out my salvation that he's given me. Here, my salvation is nearer than when I believe. What salvation? What we're talking about right here in 2 Corinthians 5, the salvation of the body, salvation of your soul, salvation of our life, and salvation of my body. That's the full gospel. That's full salvation. That is what salvation is, amen? And the Bible said, for we know. How do I know? I love that word know. It's in there, K-N-O-W. You brought it out in Sunday school in 1 John 5, 13. It's all through the Bible. The Bible says we know, we groan, but we know, we know that we have a building not made with hands. How can I know these things? Let me tell you why. It's substance. I can know because of the Word of God. I can know. I don't have to guess. And I can, be, I can get up here and say what the Bible has to say, and then I've done my job. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 1, faith is the what? Substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So what is my substance, Brother John? What do I step out? I don't step out in oblivion. I don't step out in blackness. That, yeah, the Word of God is substance. Stepping out in oblivion is mysticism. I'm stepping out on, a, on something solid. I know this stage will hold me and hold my weight. I know that. So I came up here and I, and I walk around. I know that. I know that stepping out on the Word of God is substance and whatever this Word says is going to stand up. It's going to hold me. It's got my undergirder. I'm stepping out on substance. That's why I know that I'm going to have a new body. The Bible says not only can I know that, but the Bible says that we're always, verse 6, confident. Always confident. Not just confident. And it uses it again in verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, in closing, let me say this. The Bible uses the word confident. The Bible, always confident. I know these things. I'm stepping out on something. I know that God can't lie. So I'm very confident about what I'm preaching. Very confident. The Bible says in Romans chapter 4 that Abraham was what? Not just persuaded, but fully. So he put that in there. He was fully persuaded that what God has promised, <clears throat> that he was able also to perform. That's what the Bible says. So Abraham knew Paul. We sing a song about it. Paul said, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against this day we're talking about in 2 Corinthians 5. I know these things. I know these things. The Bible says in John chapter 4, in verse uh, 10, it says, um, no, it doesn't. It say, yeah, verse 10 says, if you knew the gift of God and, uh, and who it was that spake, you would have asked and he would have given you the water of life freely. But whosoever taketh of this bread, what verse is that, 14. Whosoever eateth of this bread shall never hunger. That used to bother me. Why am I still hungry? Why, uh, what, water, whosoever drink of this water shall never thirst. In John 6 it says, eat of this bread and you'll never hunger. That's all right, I got my wires crossed. John 6, you eat of this bread and you'll never hunger. You'll never hunger or you'll never thirst. You'll never. And never means, did you find that verse? What is it? 14? 635. Read it loud. Never hunger or never thirst. Yeah, but the Bible says in John 4, verse number 14... Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. 
Now, why did I say all of that? Why am I so confident? Because I have substance. Why, why am I fully persuaded? Why do I know that he's going to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day? How can I really, really tell you and face you and say that I'll never hunger and I'll never thirst? Because I have drank of the living water and I have eaten of the living bread. There was a time in my life when people would preach that, I'd say, why am I still hungry? Why am I still thirsty, Brother Kirk? Why am I still thirsty? Because I never had a drink of the Savior. John chapter 6, I have never eat his body and drink his blood. And my dear friend, there might be some out here sitting here today that's never tasted the Savior. Hey, and when we talk about, the Bible said these words I speak are spiritual and life. We're not talking about physically eating and physically drinking. We're talking about Christ, drinking of Christ. So let me ask you, are you always confident? Do you know, do you know that if you died today, you'd go to heaven? You can know, you can know. God bless you, let's stand our feet.